The first webinar is presented by my co-organizer, Anna Foka. Anna is Associate Professor of History of Information Technology. She is leader of the Digital Humanities Uppsala Initiative at the Department of Archives, Museums, Libraries and Cultural Heritage at Uppsala University. Her research interests lie in the intersection of digital technology with historical disciplines, including art history. And she will tell us about enriching the invisible stories of women, Carl Selene's collection at the National Museum of Science and Technology. And unfortunately, there will not be no Fika break today with really nice buns and coffee uh, because of COVID. Uh, but I'm really happy to be here. I will talk today about women's invisibility in the Carl Selene's collection. And what I would like you to do um, the wonderful audience of today and uh, is to think a little bit about the term invisibility. Uh, when we are, this is uh, just to take you through a summary of what I will talk about today. I will talk about the differences between digitizing and digitalizing as I see it through my experience. Uh, I will precisely zoom in one case study called Digital Models, which has to do with uh, in the industrial history of Sweden. And it was a project that was financed, as you can see, uh, in previous uh, years from, um, uh, from 2016 to 2019 uh, from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and uh, Riksbank and Stu Williams Fund. Uh, so, it was a collaboration between Asatumo University and the National uh, Museum of Science and Technology of Sweden that is known in Swedish as Tekniska Museet. So when it came to uh, digitizing this collection, we had to, th we have, we had to think precisely in, uh, in ways in which we would reveal women uh, through the data. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about the conversion of actual museum materials to a digital format and then I will expand a little bit to talk about the epistemologies behind our digitization project, how we thought about enrichment, how we looked at policies and how we sort of harness technology to help us uh, do what we were supposed to do. So I will begin with the first question uh, here which is the digital transformation and what it does to epistemology. So when normally when we talk in cultural heritage studies and critical cultural heritage studies, but also digital cultural heritage studies, we speak about digitization as a conversion of one format to another. So we have a wonderful picture. We want to turn it into a digital format. Uh, what is the process that we do to sort of like create a digital a data, uh, uh, turn the picture into data, so to say. And then comes digitalization, uh, which pertains to organizing and reaching curating and public engagement. And that is different from just a conversion. It requires also additional use of technologies, but also has to have a strategy on how we do that. Uh, so a lot of uh, people from the library and information science perspective, like my wonderful colleagues at Uppsala, when they talk about archives, they talk about the archival materials, they talk about data, and they also talk about the enrichment, which is the kind of information we ascribe to one artifact to make it searchable and to describe it. So we're describing, we're trying to find ways to describe an artifact with metadata, if I was to put it in very, very plain terms. Um, when it comes to, uh, to uh, the European Union and Sweden, things are not particularly different there. The Swedish National Data Service dictates that all data should be made as much as possible, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Uh, so SFD basically proclaims that data has to be able to find, they should be prescribed a, 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 a persistent and unique identifier, so a social security number of sorts. It has to be accessible, you have to be able to, to find it somewhere. It has to be interoperable, so that means that it should be working in semantic web environments, which is an old technology now, it's been 20 years, but it's still sort of like complex to implement. And they have to be reusable, so as to creating generative data that then other people can reuse. And from a legal perspective within Sweden, there has to be some openness of historical data for research. And also they have to be conforming to restrictions, such as, for example, GDPR rules and sort of the European law that uh, about sensitive and personal data. Uh, in other words, 
that has its impact in how we look at collections. So, of course, you know, as several people have proclaimed, we can democratize collections by making them open and accessible. Uh, but do we actually also democratize them or do we think them through sort of colonial narratives or older narratives? I mean, the, Loventhal has said once that the past is a foreign country. So what, what do we do when we have to ask questions in 2020, when we have to release an archive? If we are museum professionals, right, we, we all have more or less the same goals. Museum professionals will want to open up the collection and, and you know, attract the audiences and make difference in society. Researchers also also want to make difference in society so they're thinking about okay this is how are we going to enrich a collection uh, and and with what sort of words we will enrich this collection and what kind of descriptors we will put down on this collection then there's a technological part and then there's also the sensitivity of some materials so how are we thinking of diversity and inclusion uh, when we enrich collections if we have sensitive materials if we have underpresented under underrepresented segments of society. How do we illustrate their stories with data and enrichment? So for this, I will move into the case study, which is the uh, particular uh, project that we've been, we will be discussing today. So how do we apply all of these things to a collection that is about to be digitized and enriched? And what do we think about it? So this was a tripartite three project uh, and I will speak today about model one which is, has to do with Carl Salin's uh, collection, an archive of the, uh, we will talk about Carl Salin later, but he was a prolific sort of industry historian and historian of technology and also was the founder of the national, uh, among other things, of the National uh, Museum of Science and Technology. Another part of this collection had to do with digitizing a journal about technology that belonged to the museum and it was a museum publication called uh, Dedalus from 1936 to about 2016 I think 20, or 2017. And then we also had to like look at Pollock's Mechanical Alphabet which had to do with uh, learning learning uh, laws of mechanics and it's an actual physical mechanical alphabet that was created in 1700s uh, and we had to sort of digitize that too in some way so we did a very creative um, process with Pollem's alphabet and, and the books were digitized and OCR and then we come to the Salins archive uh, and we had two incentives, me and my colleague Finane Jorgensen about this, that we had to be critical about this particular part and we had to look this through two actions. One was gender studies and the other one was environmental science. And okay, so then it's, uh, it's, it was a little bit like opening Pandora's box so to say, when we started working with the collection. So we started reading through feminist museology and ways of enriching the collections and acting as uh, crowdsources, what can we do? And then of course, you know, we wanted to digitize everything, but uh, as you all know that have been working with budgets and projects, this is very rarely the case. You always have a chunk that you work with. And that chunk in our case was quite big, it was eight, 1500 capsules of material from all over Sweden that he had collected and organized in his own way, Carl Salin, in, uh, around the uh, 20s or 30s. Uh, so one question was that can we actually digitize everything and then we got into the discourse of museum materiality and power relations. So yes we could but do we actually, uh, can we actually in our budget digitize everything and is, is this going to be easy to accommodate financially in the digital realm if we did 1800 capsules so we had to be selective. We also wanted to uh, digitize the more critical material so to say but part of the problem there was that we couldn't because um, some of those materials were sensitive. Those of you that work with archives and libraries know that for example if you have a 16th century map uh, of Sweden that is hand painted and very fragile, you may not want to send it too far away to digitize it. You may want to be very, very careful and precautious about it. And then also, you know, there comes the organizational dimension, which is accessibility and shrinking space. It would be good to make those searchable for the future generations and also sort of like stack this somewhere else. Uh, 
uh, which was not explicitly discussed by the museum. The next step we did was to look at what there is in terms of women in Sweden, databases and history. So we looked at two particularly interesting projects that related to content, manage content managing uh, archival material that pertains to gender. One was that we looked at, we sort of, we rested in the shoulders of giants, so to say, and we looked at the very uh, well-known project Gender and Works, which is at Uppsala University, and it's a, it's a digitization project that sort of tries to do what did women and men do for a living and looks precisely at the archives. And then we looked at Gwyn Sam, uh, which is the University of Gothenburg Library about, it's a national resource library for gender studies and we try to do what they do. Uh, these platforms were a very good point to start because the first question was like, can you actually cut off uh, and separate all women and put them in one pile of chunk in a content management system and would that be a good practice? Now in feminist museology studies we very often speak about his story and her story and um, in terms of linguistics, this is uh, also a mistake. It also has a separatist view because history does not mean literally in English his story, but it's a Greek word that denotes knowledge. So it's about having the knowledge. It's not about his story or her story. It's about acquiring historical knowledge to be able to understand the society. So what do we do? And then we looked at other international initiatives such as the Gender Center for Gender History, Gender and Work, as we said at Uppsala, Women's Work in Rural England, Women's History Network, Women's History Sto Scotland. And we decided that then we have to look at the actual archive and see what there is in there. What can we actually do? So we even, Carl Salin was a, was a historian and that was very visible when we looked at his categorization. He has his own typewritten categorization and in this categorization we tried to look if there's anything about women. Do, do you actually, does he actually separate something? What is his logic behind uh, the organization, the collection of the archive and his own classification? And his own classification had to do with um, basically different events and it was not very organized in the way a machine would organize things today and the only mention to women was you know workers and their families uh i've smelled familia now as you can see in the third entry there that's the only thing we found that related to women from his own categorization and sort of legend for the archive and then we opened up some of the capsules uh, in the very beginning of the project to see what there is in there and Although we thought that women were initially invisible, they were there and they came in different contents and formats. We had a huge diverse collection of data to look at from cuttings of magazines, from his own categorization in your bottom right, uh, you will see two pictures. And one is Drotten and Christina, and you can see that he has a specific prosopography that, as I will show you later, other materials he follows through. So he makes a cutting from a magazine and he makes his own annotation in it. That's actually his handwriting. Um, so so this, is a, this is an archive collected by a very prolific and very prominent man. And we're trying to dig out the women. Where are the women in this archive? What is, we all know about the role of women in Swedish history. We know that the 30s, as displayed by Elise Derminer and also by uh, Maria, uh, uh, Maria Ogren here, the, the director of Gender and Works, women, uh, women's work remains invisible in the early modern years. Uh, at the time when Carl Salin collects this archive, women's emancipation and women's rights is becoming to sort of happen a little bit, but he's still pretty much a person of his time. So when we actually look deeper into the materials that we have, we see that there's a lot about women of higher status, such as queens and prominent women, and very little about the other women the workers. I mean, a very famous example is Fet Mats. We decided when we started uh, the digitization process to look at what there is and see what is worth it to digitize and what can be enriched afterwards in a meaningful way. And we had to make the collective choice of picking up specific folders that denote areas. And we picked one for Kirona, one for Falun, several for Falun actually, and some for Osterbybruck, which is not too far away from Uppsala, where we are right now. And he had collected everything and organized everything by space. So it was easy to sort of like look at spatial data and enrich with spatial data and where these things are found and what they refer to. 
Um, what happened was that we decided to sort of digitize everything and we used several different uh, companies to do that because we wanted to compare prices. We ended up using the National Service for Digitization in, in Sweden and that proved a very good choice. We had uh, print photographs and maps and we decided to only work with print text because it was the cheapest to OCR, which meant that we can perform optical character recognition and make them searchable. So we thought that this would be of use to researchers. So that's so far with digitization. Then we thought about how do we become critical? How do we unearth women? So we read a lot on women of the time uh, and there's, we looked specifically at cases for Kvinliga Bruxpatroner, of which a book from an earlier time, from the 1700s and 1800s, has been written by Shesting Westerlund. And we've read it very carefully and we saw that, yes, there is women that are of higher status, there is women that can own property, uh, and one of them we found in the archive. And we thought, okay, if we are to create an ontology about enrichment, let's start with a small case studies and enrich what we can and see what we can come up with. Uh, and we've published on, we've published this particular enrichments uh, in the Digital Museum. And in, when it comes to uh, Augusta Posse, her name was Eva Augusta Hegerflicht. She was born in that name. She was a very prominent woman. She married one of the prime ministers of Sweden. She had three marriages and was in charge of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, industry land uh, and the ontology that we came by was to think about the material collection following a lot what Europeana does looking about the special data and what does it refer to can we put the geo reference that exists today are those places still today we looked at temporal data sort of absolute and relative um, times that refer to this archive. I mean, we have, for example, in this one, we have a 1904 as a picture that was taken in 1904. And that's something that comes from Salin's own archive. So we tried to keep close to as much as we could to his classifications and what he put. And then we also added prosopographical data. So we connected every pages that every online evidence that has to do with Augusta Hegerflicht or Posse or, or Gosling later, uh, she married a British diplomat, that we could put through all her names, all her identities, all the temporal data that pertain to each archival item. Uh, and that would seem very easy if we weren't very critical. So what do we do? What do we do then? Do we just single out what we have about women and enrich that was one question. Uh, what about the ethics of this? I mean, can we actually enrich everyone? There were women who were still alive in this archive. This we could not do much with because of regulations. Um, and what about emergent technologies? So can we actually, okay, let's say we cannot perform a distant reading sort of data enrichment because we are only four people and the project is long gone and the archival institution has to do other more exciting things for their outreach. Also on this. So how do we use other technologies? Could artificial intelligence such as machine learning or pattern recognition help us to unearth the women? And would it be flawless? So far, uh, we know that this is the field that is underexplored and it's people are still working with it. And I know there were, there's been several sort of initiatives by other museums to work with that, but it has been complex uh, to do. Uh, and, when, and now I would like you to take a few minutes, I mean, I think that I've been speaking now for about 20 minutes or so, is that correct? Yes? So I'm thinking I would like you to take a few minutes and concentrate on some materials that we found and think about them as I explained to you the context in which we found them. And I want you to take a few minutes to think. Uh, if you had to put this on a content management system, what would you write about it? Because there were occasions that were easy, because it was, you know, all, all white, all, all prominent fem women, uh, all Swedish, uh, or, or of other uh, prominent minority at the time. And then there were others, and their stories were very, very invisible. So, uh, for example, you see that we have uh, this particular typical pros prosopography of Queen Ulrika Eleonora when she visited uh, Falun, the Falun mines. Uh, and uh, there is what the here is what um, Karl Salin did. This is his handwriting creating this uh, archival. And then we have this 
traditional role ad of the time, which has to do with an ironing machine, Klafreström. Uh, and I want you to zoom a little bit and look, if you can, in your screens, the traditional roles of women here is that they are ironing and then they're setting up the table and the men are drinking and all everyone is partying. So what do we, what, how do we enrich that? And then we have also books and stories about the mining industry. Do we actually enrich that? Is it an important documentation of the time? What does this say about women's stories and uh, the stories of children, of workers in the archive, of, of, in the mines? Could this be something that he took? We have very little information about this. And then the most complex artifact that we came across, which we really don't know what to do. And I am probably putting a part of this page here because I really don't know what to do uh, about it. And I don't know if I am in any position to do, decide this by myself. But uh, this, is a, this was a, a clipping from a magazine uh, of a, a very famous genre at the time that started in New York. It's called jazz poetry. And somehow in one of the Osterby Brook archives, we found an advert, a translation by Alf Hendrickson of uh, this jazz poetry, which is oppressive. Op it's, it's, it's oppressed because it has to do with people of color in the United States. But somehow there was a Swedish translation of it with complex pictures that I decided not to include. I, I wanted to, I, I don't particularly want this to be invisible, but I'm not sure how to make it visible. And if I was to create a data entry for this, if I was to enrich it, what would I say? The term, I want to sort of give you a little hint and tell you that the term that they use in Sweden at the time is not just poetry and I will not I, I refrain from talking about the term they use. Uh, I will not do that, but this is something that is very interesting because we have oppressive poetry, we have a pejorative term, we have oppressive poetry, which is a good thing because it shows visibility to people of color in the United States. It also shows, it's an archive from 1933, which shows that if, if jazz poetry started in New York in 20, in, in, sorry, in 1920s, then this narrative has traveled to Sweden and people were aware of this. Uh, and, and, and how did they deal with it? And, and how can we sort of show that people were aware of this oppressive? On the other hand, you have the visuals that are very uh, confrontational. You know, we, we see the sketch of a young black woman, a young woman of color. So this is what I would like you to think. Uh, and I would like you to think also in the light of how do we speak to the museum audiences of 2020. And I would like you to take a few moments and I, I, I welcome every question. I think I will stop here. Every technical or epistemological question about this archive is very welcome. And I would, I would try to answer your questions as uh, well as I can. Thank you, Anna. That was a very, uh, very good ending. So, uh, hopefully, uh, people have been able to uh, go get some coffee or water and come back to their computers. And we're going to start a discussion uh, now with uh, Anna. So, the first question that appeared uh, was from Alexander Huber in Oxford. Did you explore a variety of ontologies for this purpose, or were you uh, uh, intending uh, to create your own? Uh, this is very interesting. We, we have published on this precise question. So I would, I would really happily also type that uh, article. Uh, but we've tested quite a lot of different ones. Uh, and what was made uh, clear, and I think that ties also to the next question, what was made, uh, what was made very visible to me was that um, we had to pick a variety of different categorizations. Uh, so for example, we, we looked at sort of, we, we had a big chunk of data themes, data sets. So one was, you know, uh, prosopographical data, which had to do precisely with a person. And then we had spatial data, where that had to do with the place and the space that it refers to. And also that the place and the space that this, this archive was picked for. Uh, and then we had um, temporal data, 
uh, that had to do with time. And there we picked relative and absolute. That also answers kind of this question. We picked everything relevant, um, uh, uh, absolute and relative options. Uh, and we were actually inspired by other projects to do that. So we've been looking at how other people are. I mean, I, I have to say that uh, uh, this is an in, this was an interesting thing to look at the ontology and come up with something because we were very much interested in unearthing women. So our part had to do mostly with prosopographical, spatial, and temporal data, but also we had to add the material data. So what kind of material is this that we find in the archive? What kind of provenance? Uh, do we have for that if there was any we did not concentrate on on materiality on provenance other than looking at the materiality and and the geographical data that came with it and we had absolute and relative options so we could accommodate more so for example if it was from 1704 we would write you know that this was collected in say 1922 but it's something that was made in 17 or four. And if we didn't have an absolute date, we estimated somewhere. And I mean, we tried to not do too many. Our plan was not to enrich the archive. Our plan was to unearth uh, uh, women in the archive. So in doing so, we thought about enriching the archive with everything that pertained to these women and their lives and the events surrounding themselves. And also we looked at international data standards. And when we actually had, I mean, there's a third question. Uh, can, I, can I just... Um, uh, read it out loud. Is it yes? Okay? Uh, so the third, the the one from Magnus is yes. that the one? Okay. Uh, so the yeah. So here is the question from Magnus, um, a woman related, uh, research related uh, thought. Um, you use Pleiades as an authority for places in Greece. One way of making researching about women easier, and more visible, I guess. Yes. Uh, is by having some Swedish linked data authority of uh, women. Uh, do you understand? Um, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. of course. I'm thinking that uh, I can talk about it in relation to other prosopographical data that we will deal with in, in the, the workshop that we will do later in September. Uh, that the very, the one option there is always Wikidata when it comes to prosopographical data. Like you can, you can pick sort of a, a linked data authority that is, you know, Wiki, Wikidata and work with that. Uh, uh, we have not, we are not, uh, this project is ended in 2019 and we just barely scratched the surface on the enrichment question, I believe, because it was only a small part of the project. It was like one fourth of the project. Uh, and, and exactly. And then uh, it's very complex because Wikipedia and Wikidata is not, it's a very biased um, it, it, it does support sort of grandmaster sta status narratives and sometimes we don't have enough information. Uh, I would say if somebody created uh, that wants to do that and that's what they are setting off to do, uh, any form of sort of like um, uh, data that, that is sort of made by subject specialists, that would be the best option. With ancient world data, we're a little bit luckier because there is already an infrastructure for them and there is already technology for them and there is already sort of aggregators and, 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 uh, and URIs and gazetteers and structured data for it. So you can just link to that. But, but for this, I don't think uh, doing that and we've been thinking about doing uh, targeted wiki data sprints, but there wasn't enough time in the project because the project was about digitizing, not about digitalizing per se. We came to the digitalization precisely because uh, we wanted to unearth women. So that's what it boiled down to. So it wasn't the incentive of the project. It was to unearth and question what can we do and why and how. It was just a pilot in that yeah, sense. Uh... I'm, I'm going to jump to a question that we got from Karin Tetteritz. Um, mm -hmm. When adding uh, information uh, in a digital catalog, uh, like Digital Museum, there is a difference between hard facts and date, names, provenance, etc., and interpretations of more contextual type. Exactly. How have you been discussing the, the difference? We have been discussing this as relative and absolute data. Uh, and that this has been a, a complexity because, as I said before, we have a number, we have, we have things that we can be certain about uh, that is in the document or the archival documents or artifacts or, or 
documentation that we have. Uh, but there are things that we are not certain about. So we decided that anything we are uncertain about uh, and we can't put something relative, a relative piece of data there, that we won't do it. Uh, so we got a question now from Stuart Dunn. Uh, have you thought about targeted Wikidata yes. sprints to plug the gaps? I believe that the museum is thinking towards that direction uh, and I will pass it to them because they own the data and it's, it's now on their responsibility to enrich it. But it could be something to consider, absolutely. Good. I'm going to ask you a question of my own now, Anna. Uh, I was thinking, you this is a, quite an interesting collaboration. Is, this is the kind of collaboration I would like to see more of uh, personally with uh, both the museums and archives being very uh, involved in the material and also the researcher coming in and, and uh, uh, bringing uh, your own expertise and, and things. What, what do you think would be uh, necessary to make projects like this uh, successful? What, 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 what do you need to make them work? I think uh, Sigolent Tart in Oxford has put it in a really nice way. I think that real collaboration begins when there are no T words, so everyone understands each other. There's no twitching T words, she calls the words that make you twitch when you say annotation and a computer scientist says annotation and they mean something completely different. Uh, or enrichment or tagging or, or all, all sorts of things. Uh, a, good, uh, a good idea, um, uh, a good idea there was to sort of think through the collection in a way that it, that it made sense and collaborate. We had a really good collaboration with the museum because they are very well, um, they're, they, they are very experienced archivists and they know the materials quite well. Uh, so one of the, the idea was that, you know, we find a way through the project to put them on CCBY format. So they're open and available. So we sort of like fit into what the policy uh, wants us to do. And also they were also made available through Europeana. So opening up sort of channels and opening ports for more people to see was the idea. Um, and that was what we were called to do. Now the enrichment became a complicated exercise and crowdsourcing with, you know, with museum is, is, is a very easy thing to say in practice, but the reality of people putting effort in crowdsourcing these kinds of information, especially subjects, uh, specialists, can be a different story. So I think organizationally speaking, it can be a complicated process to do incredible things with it, but we can always try. Thank you. Uh, we have a question now from Alice. Uh, sure. Thanks you very much for your presentation. Uh, you talked about an ontology to base your enrichment on. What is its model? Uh, BBT, CDOC, uh, I may have missed the info. And how precise do you believe the terms should be if you want to describe certain people, subject matters, do you only wish to use the general terms the public has uh, cross-reference? Uh, so that would be interesting to hear you expand upon, Anna. Ooh, which one of all the questions? Can you put oh, the question up oh, again? Don't take uh, it away. It was too many oh, interesting no, it's things. Under, oh, sorry. I put it on answered. Uh, so maybe if you can see it uh, in the tab that's called answered. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, I can't about see it anymore. Oh, I, okay. Sorry. Uh, I thought you saw the, the when I put it up live. What is the model, um, BBT or CDOC, uh, and how precise do you believe the terms should be if you want to describe certain people and subject matters? Say that again. Sorry. So uh, when you base the, the, you talked about an ontology to base your enrichment on. Yeah. What is the model? of this ontology. Uh, she, she says she may have missed it. It would be a CDOC, of course. I think that okay. is the way to go when it comes to uh, semantic web environments. Now, when it comes to the Digital Museum, I don't know um, what kind of uh, uh, model they are currently. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Yes, I can see. Uh, so I, I would t totally pick at the moment, if we were to redo everything, I would pick CDOC. 
And That's why, why is that? What is, what is the good thing about CDOC? The your... good thing about CDOC is that it, it is basically uh, interoperable with other platforms. So it enhances, it enhances, you have a structured uh, data format that uh, can comply to international data standards and then it can truly be interoperable, I believe. Um, and, yeah, and, and do you think, how do you precise, do you believe the terms should be if you want to describe people? I mean, the, the idea is I think that we always have to sort of uh, have open APIs and we have to be able to retrieve that data in XML and JSON formats, which is why we picked digital museum. Sorry, I'm still answering the mm. previous question. So, so the idea is to have sort of like, it can uh, ho help uh, if we have open APIs. And as far as I'm concerned also, we think that the, when it comes to ontologies, I think whatever we can enrich with would be good. But I think this is something that should be done in, in more automated ways. I think that crowdsourcing perhaps is not always uh, a solution, but when it comes to ontology, I can share with you, if I can share with you my screen, I can show you uh, some parts yes, of the ontology. Let's give me just one minute. And how we have kept our, what data would be there, so to say, if you give me one minute more precisely. So the enrichment was not something, I also want to clarify there that the enrichment was not something that we did. It had to do with um, what we could do at the time. And the proposed ontology that we have that we did not uh, apply because there was simply no time in the project as we were interested in digitization was that we looked at the name or names before and after matrimony, including relevant open URLs as applicable, gender, what do we know about it? Age, by which the information could be described as a relative, for example, 26 years old or absolute mid twenties or different ages referring to this particular archival item. Citizen status referring to the countries of origin or, pla or placement by proxy. Social status, married, widowed, single and unidentified other professional status, position and property. And then we also try to include data about place and time. So the reason why we did this is because we wanted to make gender a intellectual category, an essential category to be searchable. So if, for example, we enriched, if we knew somebody was a Brooks patron, and that's also a question of language that I think we very often try to tackle when we enrich collections. Uh, do we actually um, want to enrich in Swedish or do we want to enrich in English? And, and obviously, this is what we did. We wrote Brooks Patron when we knew it was Eva Hegelflicht. So we took a couple of case studies and tried to create an ontology. And we took different case studies, but we couldn't expand in more materials than we had. And we couldn't expand for too far, precisely because this was a project for three years and it had to do with digitizing the collection, not necessarily enriching it that we came to enrichment was what we saw as the natural result of making it searchable and unearthing critical questions. On the other hand, you know, it's the problem is that when you digitize, we think that digitization and digitalization are easy and yes, they can open and democratize collections, but the terms and conditions and the epistemologies by which we work are, are more complex than that. Uh, so just to clarify that, you know, we did not, we did not enrich, our job was not to enrich the collection, it was the complexities around enriching the collection that we had to face. Great. That, yeah, and as you, as you mentioned, one of the challenge, challenges when you are dealing with uh, uh, collections and archives uh, in, a, in another local language or culture is that, especially in the humanities, we do have a lot of very culture specific terms that are, we, we can translate a lot of terms, we can translate them in English and say that this is a, the, but when we come to cultural terms, that can also be, uh, I, I had a discussion with a colleague just the other day about this, which we have a certain particular type of ancient site that it, it doesn't really exist outside of Scandinavia because it, it's combined with sort of economic and historical circumstances. So do you have like any 
did you experience like how, how to deal with that uh, when you're dealing with something that is written in Swedish but should be interoperable on an international scale? Exactly. I mean that's that's part of the that's part of the complexity there. That how do we how do we make all these collections open, available, and uh, in some way sort of complying to what S and D wants us to do? Uh, and on the one hand, we've got the the laws at the European level about what we can and cannot publish, which we have to really respect. On the other hand, we have to think of fair principles. And then we have this discrepancy between epistemology, what we can actually do, how does this comply to data standards, what kind of platforms work, what kind of, CDOC, what kind of data structures work, what kind of entities we can have. So it's been a very complex uh, endeavor. And I mean, we started, imagine that we started this project in 2016 and there were already initiatives. And I think part of what, I, without wanting to speak on behalf of Europeana right now, but I think they want to unite collections and they want to open them up. And I think that us creating a portal to Europeana and uh, releasing those images in Europeana terms and those archives, whatever we could, was a good idea. And enriching them with the absolute basics so they are searchable. And of course, you know, that's the way forward. Because that one thing is to digitize and another thing is to make searchable and to enrich. And by enriching, you make searchable. And that's when researchers can go back and say, well, you know, Brooks Patroller is a classic word that we couldn't, well, I mean, the English translation would be uh, foundry proprietors, I think. We, we discussed this for days with the museum. Uh, so, because yeah, it's a very particular terminology that refers to a particular time, which is, and this is why I brought the complex questions later in the end, because yes, completely, com I mean, personally, I'm, I am, um, if this was an indigenous collection, we would talk to the community. When we negotiate this with the community of indigenous peoples, uh, but this refers to, a, to the reception, to the Swedish reception of another culture or the Swedish culture itself, then what do you do? And of course, you know, when you have complicated or sensitive terms, the law says hate speech is not a good thing. But if it's not used in the context of hate speech and the context of enrichment, what do you do? So I, I'm leaving this question open to the audience uh, now. Yeah, on, and, you know, and, and, and hard, hopefully yeah. this is something we can continue yeah. and and of course. go a bit deeper into in in the autumn, and we will hopefully have some workshops because this is uh, this is not something that's going to have a silver bullet and easy answer. Uh, Larissa, yeah. you uh, had a yeah right. Um, so thanks, uh, Anna, for your presentation. First, a comment from the chat actually. Um, Sandra from uh, the Nordic Museum writes that the mo data model that Digital Museum and the collections management system Primus and Health Culture in yes. is based on is inspired by CDOC, uh, yes, CRM exactly. and EDM. Um, and my question would actually relate to what you just showed on the screen. So you said that one of the um, items that you um, used was gender and I think that's a really interesting question because if you for example identify um, gender based on photo photographies that you just see. How would you um, reflect upon that? It's so difficult to reflect on that because uh, I mean, okay, we can, we can train, I, I will, so I will now uh, quote uh, uh, a, a very funny mathematical anecdote about our algorithms. I mean, I don't know if it's funny if you're not a mathematician, but that's normally the case with funny mathematical models. So you say, uh, you know a word by the company it keeps like if you if you do machine learning and you and you see the term a girl is sitting by a park uh, sorry excuse me a, a person is a, a child is sitting with a skirt by a park then the machine could be trained to know that this is a girl but what if this is in a context that is cultural that this this person is not a girl but is still wearing a skirt so I think that, and another thing that is very interesting is that in the Swedish legal system, you, you can't hold a, a, an algorithm of, of a, or, or, a, or, a, or a machine uh, uh, accountable for their actions. 
but it's the people who train it, of course, because it has no consciousness, not a human. So, so, but the reality is that the person, there's a person behind it that sort of like trains it to do some, to, to gives it an order and gives it a, a, an idea on how to do things and how to, to sort of recognize or how to enrich. And, and, and that is where the discrepancies between technology and epistemology comes. So how do we train a system to know a word by the context, know a word by the company it keeps, know a picture by what it carries? It's a, com it's a complex question. Mm -hmm. I don't think we are ready yet. I've been reading quite a lot on AI recently and what it can do, but I think we're not there yet. I think it's, people are working on it with different data sets and have some and good solutions, like maybe 95% okay at the moment. I think that's really an interesting topic because it's also kind of um, it's so important to actually for to, for your for projects like yours to tag women in the content, but at the same time, it's always a difficult question on why do we just tag women? Do we also have to tag men, for example? Um, what is the relevance of tagging an individual that doesn't have a name and you don't give him, uh, them another identity, but you just tag their gender? Is that really the most important thing about their personality? So I think that was a really interesting aspect of your presentation too. I think it's also very interesting what, what uh, Os Osa asked before. I mean, how do you make sure that you all work together? Well, this is the thing that sometimes the reality or anyone who works in a museum knows that the reality of the situation is that not everybody knows technology that works in a museum. Not every researcher that is a subject specialist knows technology and they don't know the organization of the museum and how that works because museums, I mean, they have their fragilities and sensibilities as organizations like everybody has. So I think going around these sensibilities and making sure that we all sit on a table and we bring our different ideas and we discuss them democratically, I think that's the only way forward. And I think that we have in, in, in Sweden in particular, knowing the landscape better the last eight years, I should say that it, there is the incentive to work together and there is a need to learn and, and progress. And I think that it's also the, uh, true in a European context that we are trying to make things work. We're trying to make voices, invisible voice visible. And in my capacity as the, as the DH uh, uh, manager here in Uppsala, we've had a lot of those questions coming in with very critical, very, very critical epistemological questions. And do, can we actually compare, say, international data standards to the ontologies we come up with? Uh, can we, should we sort of, should we use arches for this? Should we use the Digital Museum? Should we use should we use what kind of content management platform will give us the fare that we need, the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable components of any enrichment? And this is a discussion that we keep on having. And I'm, I'm really happy with the Digital Museum because it does, you know, as Sandra said, is inspired by CDOC. It does sort of like works with European data models. It, is, it can be interoperable. It's the same with SOC. Uh, SOC has a portal to Europeana. And I think that uh, enriching and opening up is how you, you really democratize research. Back to my second or third slide, uh, what Prescott and Hughes say that, you know, they, it has a potential, we can do it. So all it takes is good, good discussions and, and trying to make this world a better place. That's really nice. Uh, I was thinking uh, we're going to start wrapping up soon. So I was wondering if there is something, uh, Anna, that you felt like during this discussion or representation that uh, that you would like to comment on yourself or expand upon or uh, clarify in the light of, or something that hasn't come up that you had expected to come up. Do you have some sort of final thoughts and, and um, musings that you would like to share with us? I think data structures and metadata structures and structured data in general in semantic web environments. I'm actually saving this because I know my colleagues who are done will talk a lot about linked open data later. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that there will be more questions there. But just to say that right now we work in semantic web environments and not everything is interoperable. And I think uh, we are all trying our little with our little ways uh, to do the big thing of sort of like making sure that we have as much data as possible accessible to for truly new humanistic research. And I will speak on this as a humanist more so than a 
technical person. And also the other thing is that I'm also going to expand a lot on linked open data in our second workshop when we work with structured data for space. And I'm hoping that this will be a hands-on event of sorts. And I think it's doable as well. So that working actually with one collection and enriching, we will, I, I'm hoping we do it with participants in September. That's my sort of ace on my sleeve. So, so, so yeah, some way or other we should be yes. able to do this, but uh, we'll see if we have to do it, try to find a digital way of doing it or if we can do it physically. Um, and I'm hoping that I've sort of touched upon questions that uh, people have thought from different walks of life, uh, from museum, museum professionals or researchers have thought, how do, we, how do we enrich and what are the models and how do we work around that and what are the epistemologies behind it and how everything has to be intertwined. So technology is important, epistemologies are important, communication and rendering is important and openness is important and policies. And I stop here. Yeah, that's, thank you very much. Now, I think, uh, like, like you mentioned, uh, in the, the second webinar today, we'll uh, be with uh, Stuart Dunn, uh, who will uh, show us this, but from a rather, uh, perhaps more geographical perspective, looking out on how to visualize and using linked data to visualize information. So that's be a really interesting complement to what you've been presenting. Uh, and we can continue, pick up questions that uh, we started here, we can continue it in the afternoon. Uh, and one thing I, I myself think that, uh, that this shows is that there is no such thing as now we're done. With, when it comes to metadata, you can always add more metadata, you can add it in different uh, settings and in different circumstances, not everything has to be put in the same place, but like the question of, uh, okay, in this particular project we have focused on women or in the next project maybe we focused on uh, working class and in the next project we focus on people that are over 50 or things like that. So th this is like, this is not something that is the end all and be all it, it, and I think that's something people need to bring with them. The, the good thing about metadata is that you can just keep enriching it but of course you need to be very much prepared to deal with difficult, it's not something as, as good as artificial intelligence and machine learning can be, uh, we, we still need and we will probably always need uh, specialists uh, in, in museums and in research to help deal with the kind of terminology we're using because these are made up cultural terms and uh, trying to find ways of uh, what is okay to share in what, uh, what respect and how to deal with uh, uh, old, uh, difficult terminology is something that anyone that's dealing with a collection will probably have to deal with. And uh, we will be back here uh, and start up again as a quarter to three in Swedish time, uh, which, we, uh, which is about an hour ahead of uh, London time. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll come back and join us then and you haven't have time to uh, do some stretching and uh, relaxing in the meanwhile. <laughs>